gospel. Peace be unto all. And to thy spirit. The reading is from the Holy Gospel according to the evangelist St. Matthew. Glory to thee. Let us attend. <clears throat> the Lord said to his disciples, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. Please be seated. We're asking ourselves the question today, I guess, what is a saint? And how do we become a saint? It's a good question to ask as we're celebrating today, All Saints Day, remembering those who throughout the ages have lived a life truly dedicated to the holy and divine triune God. They were lights in the world, these saints that we read about. They were lights in a world in need of truth. And simply put, their sainthood could be saved to rest on the fact that they confessed Christ with their life. As we saw in the book of Hebrews in the epistle that was read today, confession has a cost. There's a cost that's paid by all those listed in the hall of faith, as it's called in the book of Hebrews. There's a price paid for being a public Christian. I wonder sometimes if there's even such a thing as a closet Christian. Can we truly function hidden in our identity in such a way as we wouldn't at the same time be denying him? How can we confess him? How can we confess him and be hidden? How can our light exist and not shine? If we look in the book of Hebrews today, we see the cost paid to confess Christ. We see that through faith, it says, faith being the foundation, the source of the power to live for God and to confess God. Without faith, the same book says it's impossible to please him. We can't begin to confess Christ without faith. And so it says here that through faith, these great saints subdued kingdoms, they brought down states because of their faith. So powerful and so great was this faith that they had. This subduing of kingdoms has the idea, of course, of subduing the kingdoms of this world, both physical and spiritual. But also, it's, we see in this passage that they fought real battles. It says they waxed valiant in fight, and they turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Truly, the people that went before us that confessed Christ fought and died for their faith. They wrought righteousness. At all times, they lived a holy life, regardless of society's drift. 
regardless of society's standards. Those that had faith, that confessed Christ, wrought righteousness all the while. They never slackened in the pursuit of godliness and of holiness. It says, so great was this righteousness that they obtained promises, stopping even the mouths of hungry lions when they were thrown into the pits. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. But they also died for their faith. Millions of martyrs. In the last century alone, throughout the Soviet bloc, there were millions of Christian martyrs that confessed Christ. Women, it says, received their dead to life. They prayed. They begged God. They pleaded with God, calling on Him and him alone, as did Martha and Mary, requesting that Jesus come and heal their brother. And then when he died, he rose him from the dead. They received the, this because of their prayer, because of their faith, because of their confession of Christ, their calling on Christ. All the things that they suffered, though, we cannot forget. They were stoned, it says, sawn asunder, tempted, slain with a sword, walked about naked, destitute, afflicted, tormented. The cost they paid was very high, my brothers and sisters. And furthermore, they knew ahead of time the price to confess Christ, and yet they still confessed him. Oftentimes I think of these martyrs who, knowing full well the cost would be their life to confess Christ, actually sought out, how could it be? They sought out death to confess Christ, knowing full well that their very confession, simple as it would be, would result immediately in their death. And yet we, who suffer no loss, who has no prospect of loss or physical harm, refuse to confess him day by day. How strange. It says that these all went and obtained a good report through faith. That faith was the source of their power to go and confess Christ no matter what the cost. These people were able to survive into eternal life by seeing the witnesses that were heavenly before them. Not just seeing earthly witnesses. They were able with spiritual eyes to understand the truth of the reality that there's a great cloud of witnesses watching everything that we do, whether we're in the quiet of our home or whether we're in the public sphere. This great cloud is what they looked unto. They were set, it says they were seen also, this cloud, as if with physical eyes, so real was their faith in the unseen eternal God, that they were able to lay aside every weight and go to their own personal deaths, if need be, to conceive Christ. God has to grow our eyes, my brothers and sisters, so we can see like this, so that our vision is such that we don't see predominantly, predominantly those in front of us, but we see beyond them to see those who are unseen. May God help us to have such eyes that we can see the unseen witnesses. And so it was that these true lovers of Christ, these true disciples of Christ, true followers of God, acted in accordance with their faith. And as they did so, they acted in accordance with the Master's will. We must act, ultimately, and interact with the world around us as salt, as light, as ambassadors, and as servants, and glorify Him, and proclaim Him openly, and proclaim that there's a divine, eternal, omnipotent God who we serve, who we love, and whose we are. But in our gospel, the Lord stretches this truth a little bit. It makes it very clear for us about how necessary confessing Christ is. He says simply to open the gospel today, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But, he says, whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny 
before my Father, which is in heaven. We need to confess him. We can't afford to deny him. If we have faith, we'll see those unseen witnesses, including the eyes of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we will worship and confess him no matter what the cost. There were those that he had to rebuke. Not because love of parents and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers is a bad thing, but because it can become a snare. A snare which keeps us from confessing God who is greater than our parents or than anyone that we can see or than anyone we can love. He is worthy of our love and we cannot afford to go forth and confess others more importantly than him. The apostles, represented by Peter, said, Lord, we've forsaken all and followed thee. And Jesus said, you do well. In the regeneration, in the heavenly kingdom, after the resurrection, you who have forsaken all will sit upon twelve thrones, you apostles. And he says also that everyone that does this will inherit everlasting life. He links confession clearly with eternal life. It's not optional, my brothers and sisters. And he says furthermore to make it clear that in the kingdom of God, those that are first here in this world shall be last. Those whose confession was one of something other than Jesus Christ, but perhaps of their self, of their position, of their power, will be last. And he says the last will be first. You see, forsaking everything has a reward, a great reward. And if we forsake things of this world, we'll have a great eternal reward, a heavenly reward, because we're following, ultimately, a person who is all-powerful, a person who invites us into sonship with himself. And when he confesses us before the Father, what he's confessing is that relationship that we have with him, that eternal relationship, that eternal right to sit in the heavenly places with him for eternity. God is calling us to confess him. And God is calling us to confess him simply as God and at whatever the cost would be. Practically, our confession has to be recognized to occur in several important ways. Some of them that I jotted down were that first, we confess him simply by willing to be personally obedient to him in speech, thought, and action, in every interaction with everyone we meet. We need to be willing to confess him. Secondly, we need to be willing to speak and act in defense of our hope in God and in his love for us and for all mankind. That God loves us and he loves them also. Thirdly, we need to be concerned with the salvation of others, and so speak and act in our relationships in such a manner as to lead others also to the cross and to a confession of Christ. And lastly, since we believe in God, we don't fear to do anything in front of anyone or to say anything in front of anyone that God would want us to say or do or think. This is truly confessing Christ. Some of these simple matters of confession are things like praying in public, things like making the sign of the cross in public, things like walking into this door to worship God, to confess Him. I knew people in Russia who simply went to church knowing full well that the KGB was going to await them and went off to three years in prison or more. Confessing Christ occurs in so many simple little ways it's not necessarily a big speech on the town square or on the public radio. It's how we live, how we act, what we say each and every day. These types of confessions are salvific, my brothers and sisters. Christ is looking at us to confess him, to prove our faith. If it's real, if we have his light, then it's going to shine. But conversely, denying him plays out in these same four areas. By being disobedient to God publicly and privately, by disobeying him in speech, thought, action, and interactions with other people. We deny him. 
when we're unwilling to speak and act in defense of our hope in God and our love for Him. Unwilling to speak, we deny Him. When we're unconcerned with people's salvation and we speak and act in our relationships in an ungodly way so as to push them from the Lord, we deny Christ. And when we don't believe enough, when we don't believe enough that we fear to do what's right and godly before others, and all these things that I mentioned, and other things far beyond that, we deny God. Truly, I think there's a calculation that needs to go on in our heads. There needs to be a calculation about what is important. We need to see God and we need to confess Him. Those of little faith or no faith will deny Him. Those with faith in God and hope in God will confess Him. If we put ourselves first and consider only in this life things that we see and can taste and handle, we'll find that we're last with God. We can't have it both ways. We, in fact, choose our destiny by how we confess Christ. When we abide in faith, when we believe these words of Jesus, we confess them and we live. Let nothing hinder our eyes. May they be open to see the heavenly testimony of the angelic hosts, and of God the Father, and of the word of the Lord Jesus, and the wooing of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, and that we might have a dedicated testimony before this world, such that neither sword, nor torture, or loss of life would take us off the path of divine blessing. My brothers, my sisters, the Lord is watching us. May we be found giving glory to him before men, no matter what the cost, May we live before this great cloud of witnesses that's unseen in such a way that we look towards the prospect of eternal reward. May God grant us the strength and faith to confess Him in all that we do, in all that we think even, in all that we act and say before everyone, before the entire world or in the quiet of our homes. Someone is always watching us, my brothers and sisters. May we be diligent and dedicated to pleasing the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who watches from heaven, confessing him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.